Hi, I am Paula Hawkins and I'm here on the Walsons channel um, to do an Instagram live with Viv Groskop. Um, we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. Um, so I'm, when we'll be starting as soon as Viv joins me, in fact, what we're going to be doing tonight is talking about um, the six books that we chose for our shortlist for the Women's Prize. And ooh, I think that might be Viv. Ah. that Viv is now coming on. She might not be. Anyway, in the meantime, ah, she is. Thank you, Zai. Hi. So good. Hello. Hi, How are you? I'm okay. I knew that you would have some sort of fabulous library behind you. <laughs> so I've opted to not remotely try to compete. Oh. Um, you're looking very glamorous though. Is that the room that you work in? Do you write in that room? I do. This is, well, yes, this it's is, um, yes, it is. It's very nice. Yeah. Love um, it. And right. So I've got to do a few preliminaries. I've got to say that I'm delighted to be here on the Walston's channel this evening um, for this Instagram live. Walston's are a partner of the Women's Prize and together the Women's Prize and Walston's will be offering book and ticket bundles for the special digital shortlist reading events which are happening ooh. On... yes exactly ooh indeed the 6th 7th and 8th of september there will be um well-known actors including people like amory duff and ben miles will be reading from each of the shortlisted books there will also be some videos from the authors themselves where they take you either around i think their home or somewhere that was important to them when they were writing the the actual book and you'll be able to ask questions and all that sort of thing. So that you can get on womensprize.live, I think is the site. I will check that. Um, there is the actual winner of the prize is going to be announced on the 9th. And you can also buy tickets for that. So mm -hmm. what you basically you need to be following the Women's Prize account and this and the Wollstone's account. And you'll be fine. Um, anyway, I should let... <laughs> I should introduce Viv. I am an author, so is Viv. We are both judges on the Women's Prize this year. Uh, Viv is a writer, um, a stand-up comedian, a broadcaster, and the host of a chart-topping podcast called How to End the Room, and has just had, I think, another book published quite recently? Yes, I have. I can't just let you say that, though. I mean, obviously, people will know who you are who have tuned into this, but my fellow judge, Paula Hawkins, <laughs> is a ginormously, ridiculously best-selling author. Um, and I've had such a good time getting to know her on this prize, and I'm really thrilled that we can do this event together. Although I have to say, it's quite weird, um, and we should say, I think, straight up that we don't know who, genuinely, we do not know who the winner is. We haven't oh, had no idea. Have not Absolutely had no idea. Um, so I had some trepidation in agreeing to do this live because I don't want people reading too much into what we're going to say. Um, I don't want Paula reading too much into what <laughs> I'm going to say. Um, because as anybody who's dug into the mechanics of how these kind of prizes work, a lot of it is to do with the, the dynamics in the room at mm. the time of judging. Um, and I think we're not a very calculating political team. Um, but mm -hmm. I do think that it could go any way at this or, or this particular year. So it's sort of an interesting time to be talking about the shortlist uh, when we're... Is. We haven't actually had the meeting yet, but it's good because we don't have to have poker face and pretend that we don't know who it is because we genuinely don't. We really, really don't know who it is. And I think, um, yeah, we've had an ex we've had quite a weird judging process anyway. We haven't actually, the judges haven't seen each other for a really long time because of lockdown and all these sorts of things. So it's going to be quite interesting, I think, to all be back in a room again um, in, a, in a week's time or whenever that is. And actually, because we haven't been able to talk about anything. So... We, I just have no idea what everybody else is thinking. Um, having said that, I feel we should uh, get on and start talking about the books. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, the, good, the great thing about this shortlist, I would say, is that 
it's six books that represent a really wide variety of reading tastes and they're very representative of the very wide variety of reading tastes on the judging panel and um, I think people yeah. need to know that on any prize the the books that get through to a long list or a short list let alone the winner are really really representative of the tastes of that group and if you had a different group it would be a totally different list I would say in any year oh. That's I think what that's I really like about this list, and I think it really represents us as a group. Yes, and I think there could have been, a, you know, a dozen different shortlists from the submissions that we had because it was such a strong year, and we had so many brilliant books. It was actually an incredibly difficult process to get to six. Yeah, but, yeah, but it was, and yeah, as you say, different different people, different a different combination of people might come up have come up with a different with a slightly different list. Uh, yeah. But we have ours, it is brilliant. And um, there are six authors on it and I'm doing them in alphabetical order. And we are starting. So we just, we're just gonna talk a little bit about what we like about these books, why I guess they're on the short list and what they're about and why you should be reading them. And number one is Dominicana. <laughs> um, and I, <laughs> Yeah, go on. I, well, I was just going to say that this is one of the books that I've enjoyed more and more with each reread, which, I, you know, it's one of those ones that I keep returning to and going, oh, that's actually, that's, I've just, yeah, my love for it has grown. Um, and I loved it in the beginning anyway. So that kind of tells you it's a, it's an amazing story. It's um, set in Dominican Republic and then in New York in the 1960s. It's an immigrant tale um, about a young woman, um, well, she's a girl really she's 15 who's married off um to a 32 year old man and she goes from sort of rural um dominican republic to live in new york which is obviously a massive culture shock and it's about her life there and why did you love it <laughs> well i have to say paula i was about to say exactly the same thing as you which is that this book has quite surprised me as we've gone through the mm -hmm. process because i have grown to love it more and more uh, it's the second novel. It is based on the true life story of the author, uh, Angie Cruz's mother. And mm -hmm. in, she's got a lovely uh, dedication at the back where she explains that, you know, this is the untold story of, of dozens of women that she knows and that her mother knows. And mm -hmm. for me, when I was rereading it, because I'm sure that you and all the rest of the judges, we will have read I think minimum twice or three times, maybe four times, um, a lot of the books on the short list mm -hmm. in order to get to the winner. And for me on this most recent rereading of it, I suddenly saw it in a completely different light. It's a very, very strong novel anyway. And mm -hmm. then when I reread it again, I think I was really able to give it a lot of time and attention. And I suddenly saw it in a completely cinematic way and thought, you know what? This is almost like a female Goodfellas, but without the violence. It's got that <laughs> like feeling of 1960s immigrant New York of people yeah. trying to get by the best that they can, not always doing things entirely legally, but you really get to see inside the heart of the characters. And it's not, of course, it's a woman's story. It's a brilliant story of, of what it is to be a daughter, what it is to be a mother, what it is to be a wife, what it is to be um, a girl who's pretending to be a woman and all the men around her treat her as if she's a woman or this, she's really a girl. But also the lives of the men are brilliantly described as well of all the compromises they have to make. And they do yeah. have this kind of like almost sort of mafia, Scorsese kind of quality to them of like living on their wits. Um, but they also have a certain charm that you kind of don't blame them for being so terrible. So it's a sort of brilliantly nuanced take on that kind of side of immigration that we rarely read about and I just think it's brilliantly brilliantly realized and really rings true. I did think that the nuance in the character and the, the the development of the characters is fantastic because some of the things they do are absolutely monstrous and yet nobody is a monster you and you you know you can empathize with almost everybody at, at certain points in the book so I thought that was one something that she achieved really amazingly and it's about you know, it's about family and duty. Um, it, it really is, um, and how hard it is, and the, the awful choices you have to make when your, you know, when your horizons are, are narrowed in the way of often an immigrant's horizons are. So I think it's a, it is a it's a very clever book, and you know, it, it's 
it it rewards I think as all the books do rewards returning to yeah definitely um so that is number one we I haven't got to talk it's in alphabetical about. order it's very um very fair of you I suppose that is what you yeah well I thought that was otherwise people were going to read things into this basically. yeah <laughs> going this so number two you might have heard of is Girl, Woman, Other by Bernadine Evaristo, which has already won the book prize. And it's um, very easy to see why. It's a phenomenal book. I was so looking forward to, to returning to it. It's such a joyous book. And it's so, it's, you know, incredibly readable for something that actually is not, um, it's not sort of traditionally structured. It's a slightly experimental structure. And please, please don't let that put you off because it's in no way difficult. It's actually just very readable. And um, Bernadine Evaristo has the slightly lyrical way of writing. There's not very much punctuation, but it flows so beautifully. It's fluid. Um, and it's a, it's a really gorgeous novel. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I would say, Paula, that this is probably... Um, uh, I don't want to uh, preempt any of our discussions at the final judging meeting, but I imagine this book is very close to your heart in its <laughs> experimental nature. You know, we had a lot of really strong experimental postmodernist reads uh, that were part of the submissions for this year, really strong. And I know, Paula, that is very much in your reading taste and you absolutely <laughs> love uh, you love that kind of freedom of creativity, um, which is something I was really, really excited to discover about your reading taste. Uh, but I agree with you. This book really succeeds in making that more experimental style accessible. And I think the audience that this book has reached is incredible. I think a lot of people who've really enjoyed this book, they wouldn't have expected uh, to read a book that is so experimental and doesn't have a traditional narrative structure. It's quite a difficult book to talk about um, mm -hmm. when and you're talking to people who haven't read it because it doesn't have really have a plot it, it doesn't really have a through line uh, it's these 12 different narratives of women in contemporary Britain who redefine what it means to be British redefine what it means to be a woman and as you say it's written in this grammatical structure that Bernadine Evarista has kind of invented for herself uh, and that feels very stream of consciousness it feels very real uh, but it's mm -hmm. not something that it's I totally unlike anything else uh, I think on the shortlist the longlist or out of any of the submissions you know it's closer to perhaps Emma McBride or um what's it called the Ducks Newbury thingy um, um, it's, this, but it's, it is, <laughs> it's much more in, in immediately engaging and accessible I think than something like Ducks Newbury, Newbury Port and although you say as you say it doesn't have a traditional plot line there, it, there is lots of plot in it because there are lots there's lots of intrigue there's lots of this betrayal there's there are these amazing love affairs there's um all sorts of different kind of relationships and revelations and we you know right up to the end of the book we're discovering things about these amazing characters that she's drawn um so it it is it's thrilling you know you don't have to go into it thinking it's going to be this sort of slightly odd terribly cerebral thing it is cerebral too, but it's also just incredibly enjoyable as a story of 12 lives. Yeah, it, I mean, it's something around. very naturalistic about the dialogue and there are parts yeah. of it that almost feel as if they've been transcribed. And yes. that's, in a way, what makes it so easy to read is that it feels like someone's talking to you. And yeah. I think that's an incredible achievement in a novel where you sort of lose sight of the writer and you can just hear the characters coming off the page. And it is incredibly immediate and, and, and it feels just so, so about this moment, doesn't it? It's one of those, well, there are actually a few books that feel about this moment, um, but this is one of them about Britain as it is right now um, and all, so many issues um, that, we, that we're all talking about at the moment. And it's also really funny. Yeah, <laughs> I it's funny. That. It's, it's very funny. I really eye for character. She's got an yeah. dialogue. She understands the psychology of people, and mm. got such a hinterland of understanding, uh, especially of the sort of characters and ideas that we haven't really read about before. That that's absolutely. You know, that's that's really awesome. Risto is such an interesting person even to read about. You know, or read mm. about because she really is somebody who has bided her time and stuck yeah. to the principles to get to this point. 
I think that's absolutely true. I, I do think that's true. Um, I think I could talk about that um, goal and other for about four hours, but unfortunately we don't have that. So I am going to move on to number three, which is A Thousand Ships by Natalie Haynes, which is um, a, a, it's a retelling of the Trojan Wars stories, but from the point of view of the women who... Um, well, I was going to say feature in those stories, but you don't usually feature in those stories. We don't really hear about them very much, apart from Helen, of course. Um, but this is, Natalie Haynes has taken a whole host of women, I didn't count them up actually, who um, are mentioned in various um, parts of these stories and she's she's given them voice and it is phenomenal. I just adored this book. Um, it's funny and tart and irreverent and just heartbreaking. And for something that is about you know, occasionally the most horrendous subject matter. It manages to be engaging and, as I said, hilarious a lot of the time. It's a it's a real achievement, I think. Yeah, I, I love this book. And uh, it's interesting. I was just thinking, I was saying that, you know, Bernadine Evaristo is really experimental. And there's nothing quite as experimental on the, on the shortlist. But actually, in its structure, this book is very experimental. You know, it hops from viewpoint to viewpoint. It, it, it almost um, gives you a bird's eye view of what's going on outside mm. of the gates of Troy and moves from one group to another, from one woman to another, and lets you see things from all these different perspectives, um, almost in a sort of documentary kind of style. And Nathalie, mm. obviously, she's a classicist. You know, she's made her name as a stand-up comedian and somebody who reinvents the way that we talk about myths and um, Greek and Roman mythology. Um, she She's just fabulous the way that she mm -hmm. makes these stories feel real and makes them come alive. And mm -hmm. for me, the, where this book might have fallen down would be if it was a bit gratuitous in the, oh, this here we are learning from the women's point of view. But she doesn't make you think that for a second. It feels as if, oh, this is a real story that needed to be yeah. told this is what was really going on and there's so many brilliant visceral details you know she's really great at describing battle she's really great at describing like the physicality of some of the warriors and there's this brilliant group of women warriors who I love uh, in this that she describes brilliantly who sort of don't do as well as they'd like to but you're really kind of rooting for them mm. and it, I'm not somebody I can know a bit about Latin because I did Latin A level, but I really Greek is a bit of a is a bit Greek to me. Hey, crazy! Um, I really didn't. I don't know that much um, about the Greek myths, despite having read mm -hmm. of Madeline Miller. That would have been my first entry point. Yeah. But this really takes it on and takes it into something that is, as you say, really entertaining and lively. Mm -hmm. And it also is another book that really just gives you more the more you read it. Absolutely. And it's, I, what I loved is the way she sort of um, she interrogates that the whole sort of the whole patriarchal tradition of myth making and the way we tell tell stories and the way we um, the, the, the kind of people we talk about and the kind of people we make heroic. And she's looking at and she's she's sort of asking, well, what is it that we see as, as heroic? Um, is it slaughter and revenge and all these kinds of things? How about the people who just looked after their children and protected their families why why aren't they held up as heroes so i think that's the really that's one of the really wonderful things she does is showing us these other heroes who just never were heroines who, who don't really get talked about and yet what they have done is is actually much more extraordinary yeah exactly um and having said that not obviously not all the women are good there are some pretty terrible women in there with this is not some sort of painting all the women as glorious but um it is an interesting interrogation of what of myth making i think yeah absolutely mm. so and it, it really makes you want to i'm i was also somebody who didn't really know know a great deal about uh, about these stories and it really makes you want to find out more it now makes me want to go and read lots of stuff about green myths well i feel like natalie haynes is, this is just the beginning <laughs> yeah yes exactly <laughs> next next please natalie yeah <laughs> I think she does have another one coming up, so we can look forward to that. Well, she's got a book mm. coming out, I think, in uh, September called Pandora's Jar, which Thank is um, a, a non-fiction book about oh. the true the, the myths as they are told. Yeah, oh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, that's one to look out for. In the meantime, we have <laughs> the matter, and I have to use both hands for this one. Okay. Yeah. 
Check C that is out. For Cruz, E is for Evaristo, H is for Haynes, and M is for Mantel, our fourth choice. Yeah. Uh, so this really is a book you could talk about for hours because there is so much in it. And I do think that what Hilary Mantel has done with the trilogy is an absolutely extraordinary thing and people will be reading it for years and years and years and returning to it and rediscovering things in it, um, you know, the way you do with great classics. It's an extraordinary book. And it's a cracking story. From the opening page where we're having, you know, Anne Boleyn's head is being severed. It just, you, you're right in there with the blood and guts and with um, Cromwell's feelings about this and his feelings about the people around him. Um, it's an absolute masterclass, I think, of um, revealing character through dialogue. The dialogue in Hilary Mantel's books is second to none, I think. It's absolutely extraordinary. And what's so extraordinary to me is that it's, you know, we're talking about hundreds of years ago, and yet the language neither feels anachronistic nor archaic. It feels absolutely as though you would, you know, they, they talk slightly differently to us, but we still understand them. It's not like reading something that you, you know, that you have to sort of concentrate on every word it flows and there's an extraordinary sense of suspense in it too given that we all know how it's going to end mm. um well i assume most people know how it's going to end it's still she manages to maintain this incredible tension all the way through so in the last sort of 100 pages or so you're kind of holding your breath to see how this terrible thing uh plays out yeah i mean what can you say about this <laughs> that has not been said it's such an extraordinary journey that she has taken readers on I know it's going to be a question for us as to the nature of a trilogy uh, in, mm -hmm. a, in judging a prize that's going to be a question we already grappled with a little bit and we'll probably grapple with it some more uh, for me um, I love Hilary Mantel's writing and she's second to none but I'm not I wouldn't say I'm a great expert in historical fiction and um, I probably came to this with very little knowledge of uh, Wolf Hall and Bringing Up the Bodies. I think Wolf Hall mm -hmm. I had quite a long time ago. I hadn't read Bringing Up the Bodies. And what I loved about this is that it does create its own world. It doesn't feel as if you're catching up on the previous books. And it feels as if you could read them in any order. And I mm -hmm. think maybe that's oh, yeah. important to say. So if you feel like, oh, I can't read that book because I haven't read the other ones, you don't have to feel that way. Um, um, maybe Hilary Mantel will send me a, a message complaining that people should read them in order. But I don't think you necessarily <laughs> have to. Uh, what I love most about her writing is this fully immersive quality. So she creates this world that, of course, you know it's based on on historical events and you know her research is incredible and she wears the research really really lightly I mean I don't mm. think any research more seriously than Hilary Mantel does but it's almost as if this is a fictional universe that she's created herself so yeah. she completely owns the characters and I think that is where that strength of dialogue comes from is because those people are completely real to her and the way yeah. she describes uh, how how people walk what they wear the the nature of their speaking the way they listen it it just feels so present and so real mm. it really does um and i think that we, you were talking about whether you have to read the book before and i i completely agree with you you don't and what hillary mantel manages to do is to return to the events of thomas Cromwell's earlier life but not in a way that really intrudes on the narrative you just you get these glimpses back and they're incredibly rich in detail as well but there are these just these little asides and so if you have read the 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 other two books you'll know exactly what she's talking about and they're just these very rewarding reminders but if you haven't you learn you learn the, the you know the background there it's incredibly skillful actually i think that's a very difficult thing to do in a trilogy to make books stand on their own the way she has made yeah, these three stand, stand independently yeah um and there are so many wonderful characters in it as well i just and i did i heard um hillary mantel give an interview recently where she said that people keep writing to her saying oh okay now do so and so and you know and she wants people constantly asking her to write historical fiction about new characters and she's refusing to do so but i would just like to put in my bid for lady rochford please <laughs> 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 Because I would, I would love to read um, Hilary Mantel writing Lady Rochford's story. Um, 
So I think we are now coming to number four, which is That's another piece. Five, five. Five, yeah. Five, sorry. Yes. Five, yeah. Um, another piece of historical fiction, but a very different one, which is Hamlet. Little like Hamlet. <laughs> Little Hamlet. Isn't it beautiful? Um, Hamlet by Maggie O'Farrell, which is set in, is also 16th century, late, very late 16th century, and is about um, the death of the son of William Shakespeare. So, well, that's sort of what it's about. Who's but not actually, called Hamlet? He called Hamnet. Hamnet, yes. See what she did there? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. And... So, well, you, do you want to talk a bit about this one? Yeah, well, I I have to say, I came to this in a, quite a lot of ignorance. I love Maggie Farrell's work. I've read everything that she's written. I think she's an extraordinary novelist, particularly in her vers versatility. And this is really unusual for her. You know, she's the first historical novel. I mean, I guess you could say Vanishing of Esme Lennox was sort of historical, but it's the first time she's gone outside of, like, the last 150 years. Uh, mm. And to take on Shakespeare it is quite a, a task and when I first saw it I just I literally did think like an idiot you know why have they mis misspelt Hamlet um, and yeah. it turns out of course I mean it is a very strange thing that Shakespeare did to take his son's name Hamlet and change it into Hamlet like in a crazy act of disguise um, yeah. so, you know people wouldn't think that it was about his grief as a father anyway Maggie Farrell moves way beyond all of that and she goes into the family story behind mm. the loss of a child and also I mean a brilliant evocation of marriage in this because yeah. it's all about the mother and the father's different feelings towards their responsibilities as parents and towards their responsibilities to uh, the fate uh, of a child and how that can affect your creativity mm. how it affects your relationship to love and and it's just an incredible piece of writing again like very strongly evocative she just drops you right into that period and you believe every single little detail and you can smell the herbs in the medicines that his wife makes and uh, and you can sort of imagine going on the journey to see his student that he teaches latin to and you you really feel as if as if you're there but it has this incredible heart uh, this book mm -hmm. it's absolutely heartbreaking um and it's a very sort of modern take uh, in terms of its attitude towards parenting and psychology on a historical story and mm. it feels so incredibly original because I, I don't i'm sure that there are books about shakespeare and about this that tackle this but to yeah. bring it to life in this way and that is so accessible i think is so important and such an incredible idea and brilliantly realized mm. I don't think there are books that maybe treat his marriage as this, as the love story that she that she treats it as that Maggie O'Farrell does. Um, she writes about their their love affair so so beautifully, and she gives the person that we know as Anne Hathaway, but her name is actually Agnes, um, which I think was her real name. Um, she gives her the most extraordinary story, um, and she makes her into this this fierce. Um, dominant character and, and you know Shakespeare fades into the background he's never actually named in the book and he's not important she is the one who's who's this extraordinary person she's a healer she has this incredible presence um, and it's yeah about their different responses to grief it's I think as a book about grief it's one of the best books I've ever I've ever read actually it's an extraordinary book um and having said that it's not a depressing book it's a, it's absolutely beautiful Maggie O'Farrell's language is just gorgeous um it is a, I found this an absolute pleasure to read and she manages to be um she, O'Farrell manages to be so sort of careful and economical with her language and yet she just nails the thing um, and she can also be sort of very sort of visceral and bloody and she doesn't mince her words at all. She is, um, she is a really wonderful, wonderful writer. And the character of Agnes is just one, it's just fantastic. And I think this is one of those things that's really enjoyable to read because when in other fictional takes about Shakespeare or perhaps even non-fictional ones, the, the wife back home is always treated as this like 
inconvenience that, he, mm. you know, this rather unglamorous inconvenience that he's left behind while he goes off and does exciting things in London. And actually this is showing her as this very, this very substantial person. Yeah, um, whom he absolutely. Um, so that, that was really lovely. Um, so last but not least, we have Weather by Jenny Offal, which I loved. Jenny Offal is a wonderful, wonderful writer. She's really funny. And this book uh, was written before uh, the coronavirus, coronavirus crisis, obviously. She, it's, it's, it's actually a book about, it's about preparing for a catastrophe, but a completely different catastrophe. She's writing about climate change. But it felt unbelievably close. It feels very close to the bone at the moment um, because it's about, you know, about existential dread, really. But it's an incredibly funny book about existential dread. Yeah, I mean, Jenny Offal is a hilarious writer. She is incredibly dry. She is ruthless. She's cruel. You know, she really doesn't pull any punches. And what I love about this book is it's such a contrast to everything else on the list. It's quite short. It's quite episodic. Uh, it's almost written in a sort of script form where there are just very short um, you know, episodes where you meet different characters. And it's, it's also kind of about the relationship between a brother and a sister. But mm. a lot of it is written in almost a sort of newspaper column style where... Yeah going into the internal monologue of of this woman who is completely stressed and pl plagued by her anxiety about what is to come and mm. yeah as you say it, it's really extraordinarily prescient and I remember when we Oh yeah, when we short, when we long listed it, we which was a long time ago. It was like three years. Yeah. Ago, uh, we <laughs> said, you know, oh, this is just so timely and so prescient. And then by the time we had the short list, we were in the pandemic and it was early yeah. lockdown, and we were having our meeting on Zoom to our four hour meeting on Zoom, after which I had to have therapy um, to decide. <laughs> uh, and by then we're like, oh my god, this this book is like looking into a crystal ball. Yeah, yeah the absolutely. tone of it feels so right for this year yeah. and yet it's ultimately it's a hopeful book it's not a depressing book by by any stretch of the imagination and it it's a, at the heart of it is a woman who cares for people who cares very very deeply for other people and is she's constantly trying to help everyone around her so um it, it's it's not a book i think that you should shy away from if you're feeling anxious about the current uh you know the situation of the world it's actually very hopeful and very, well, I wouldn't say reassuring because I don't think she's that, she's not giving any simple answers to anything, but um, it's a very heartening book, I think. Well, she makes you feel better because she's funny, right? Yeah, that's also true, yeah. Just, she gives you things to laugh at and it is, it is very funny. She's a, she's a wonderful writer. So, do we have them? I can actually pile them up. Well, I might not be able to pile them up. I'll probably just drop them on the floor. <laughs> Anyway, um, so the judging process on Zoom, you found that quite stressful, did you? Oh, did you not find it stressful? Um, I think it was because it was quite a lockdown and we hadn't really got used to using Zoom yet. It was maybe yeah. just a few weeks in and it's a very intense process, especially because this is a very weighted year, it, you know, mm -hmm. even not counting the pandemic, which has made it even more stressful I think for us um, I mean I'm not like get out the world's tiniest violin I mean this is a lovely lovely job to have it's wonderful but it does yeah. the burden as well um, and because it was the 25th anniversary I think um, that either by design or by accident there were an awful lot of books in contention this year that are really heavy hitters you know not yeah. just from really big names and people who have won the prize before but also from very very strong debuts you know i think that publishers can be very calculating about about this prize without yeah. anything away or being too mean but they want to give their authors the best chance of, of winning it or of being shortlisted or longlisted because it makes such a difference to an author's career and so a lot of books were released uh, i think to time with this 25th year so yeah. you absolutely want to give every care and attention that you can to every single book so to land on 
the shortlist moment, you know, in Torino, when you're reducing 16 books to six, that is quite tough because you already yeah. had a big argument to get it down to 16. Then to take that down to six is, is really hard. And to do that when you're not in the room with each other is yeah. really difficult. And also that the timing of the prize, you know, has changed a lot. So originally the prize would be announced in June um, and now it's come gone to September. So that I think has increased our responsibility as judges to, yeah. you know, really make a choice that stands the test of time. We give an extra time to read these books, which, which makes you feel even more pressure. Like I really yeah. have to make a really strong value judgment about this. <laughs> and so, yeah. I don't know. I'm maybe putting myself under a bit too much pressure, Paula. Do you think? You are. You are. Um, it's yeah. had. It's, I mean, it has been very difficult. Yeah. I think to get to this point, and it's going to be it to get to the. I well. Yeah, I, I'm slightly. I am actually slightly dreading the final judging meeting. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be nice to see everyone, but um, yes, it's still going to be. It's going to be a, a very tough ask. Um. I mean, they were, they were so, as I said earlier, I think they, you know, we could have made several long lists worth. There were so that many really, really strong submissions on this, on this list. And I know somebody has asked in the questions um, whether there were books, you know, that we would have liked to see in there. And I think everyone had their, their, their personal favorites that didn't, um, it didn't, didn't yeah get in. i mean so people know how this works you know if you have a personal favorite whether it's before long list or during long list going on to short list and you're the only person speaking up for it sorry but it's not going to go on yeah, yeah. Uh, and that can be heartbreaking you know for me there's an, uh, and i kind of don't feel really comfortable necessarily saying what those books are because it doesn't feel fair there, there were some absolutely stellar books that didn't actually make the make absolutely. the short list and i think that, that uh, yeah there were books just, it was just that, such a ridiculously strong year yeah both of us yeah. spoke up for different books um, yeah. in another year with different judges could have even been the winner you know that's yeah. how strong a year it has been but mm. as I said before, you know, it needs to account for the judging tastes of the group and different people have different ideas about um, what they think is brilliant or what they think is really speaking to this moment. Mm. And that is a huge consideration. You know, that's why I love I love these kind of prizes and I've judged a lot of prizes. Um, and I know there's a lot of criticism around how valid prizes are nowadays and everybody wants all art to be rewarded. Um, but I think these prizes are hugely valuable because they allow us to disagree and to say, oh, well, you, this judging panel is terrible. Why did they <laughs> select all of these terrible books? You know, I think that's great that it opens up mm and that people acknowledge that every single choice is a subjective one you know there's no such thing as like the objective best book of the year there's never going to be and that's what's great about reading is that we all read books differently we all love authors in different ways and mm. prizes are kind of a celebration of that subjectivity absolutely i think that i think that is a very good note on which to close this um because we've slightly run over time um thank you so much for oh, thank to you it's very nice to see I you and i to, can i move into your library sorry i want to move into your library i'll just sleep oh, right. in yes, well, sleeping bag I'm next, your desk. next time you're up here um you must come and and hang out um but i believe i will see you for the final judging very yeah. soon face to face heavily masked i'll be there <laughs> Okay, thank you to everyone for joining us for this Instagram Live. Now I have to remember to, to, to save this and not lose it. So um, I'm going to panic about doing that. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thanks, Paula. Thank you. I am, oh, God, end video. What do I have?